there's a nice ring around the Earth. It's superconductive because you're in the matrix itself. It's one electron balanced by a positron. The sun above your head has to drip its men's true all blood into the holy grail at the center of the dish or there's no aurora borealis coming out. So you're in hell. That's Helios above your head up there, people. You have a double helix. You say, hello. You know, how's your health? You need any help? It's because you're in hell and you need to get to the center of the dish before you're dead. Drink from the living waters and uh, pass into the land of perpetual twilight, the Garden of Eden. It's just that simple. You don't have to like it. Every compass is pointing to the very center of the flat earth plane where you get eternal life and your way out of the matrix. And everybody only focuses on total shit and lies, the space station and all that. It's all fake. Everything's fake. There's a dome up there. The earth is not floating through space as an accident. You're not made from monkeys. Everything you think you know to be true is the reverse of truth. The devil already has your soul in the Vatican and your parents gave it up willingly. Now you're lost at sea. You're officially dead. By legal definition, you're a monster with no inheritable blood. You don't have to like it, but you're living the game agony right now. So when you unfold your cube, you see it turns into a cross. And I'm telling you that every compass is pointing to the center of this flat earth plane, where the aurora borealis is coming out, hitting the parabolic mirror and showering down at you like the matrix code. Every compass is a sphere of destiny. I'm explaining it to you. You don't have to like it. But I'm going to scream this out from the top of my lungs over and over and over and over because I have the Spear of Destiny. As some of you may already know, we live on a flat plain. Mountains and plateaus are actually the stumps of ancient trees that were cut down. And the moon, our chakras, and kundalini are unnatural energetic implants. Basically, everything we know is a complete lie. Those in power, however, have clearly shown us the way out of this insane matrix through symbols and vocabulary. The Christmas tree is the ultimate symbol for the way out of this matrix. Christians put an X on the bottom and place a green tree on top. Then they place ornaments spiraling around the tree. At the center of this flat plain once grew the tree of life. This tree extended out and at one point covered the earth. All of the giant trees were connected and in part powered by the Aurora Borealis. The Aurora Borealis is a powerful green light that's now instead shooting out from the center of the plain where the tree of life is no longer standing. The sun moves inward and outwards, bringing the seasons. The Christmas tree represents the astral light, the ornaments represent the sun, and the X is marking the spot of the hole at the center of the plain. The way out is through this opening. When we jump through it, we are pulled through dimensions and are placed back in our original bodies, leaving this part of the flat plane which is hexed in energetic confines and deception. Look at a compass. The north needle points towards this hole. This is why it's marked red or with an arrow. Broken down, the word compass sounds like come pass. This is not a mistake. They are hiding in plain sight the instructions to the way out. The X on the bottom of the Christmas tree symbolizes the hole. This is why we say X marks the spot. Take a look at an exit sign. E, as we know, stands for everyone. We then have the letter X and the word it. Everyone, the X is it. The X is the exit. It's all in plain sight. The vowels are a jigsaw puzzle explaining this. Our vowels are A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. If you take the E and turn it 90 degrees to the left, it turns into a W. Place it at the beginning. If you put the Y at the end, that spells way. The I remains stationary because it symbolizes the astral light shooting out of the hole. Add a T on the right hand side and you get the phrase way out. I'll explain more in future videos. Okay, so let's get back to the sun. The arc shape symbolizes the sun's passing into this hole. We already know that the story of Jesus is an allegory for the sun's movement. The candy cane, said to stand for Jesus, represents this arc shape. When you put letters from the word go on top of each other, the sun's arc into the hole becomes clear. I'll also mention that green on traffic lights is go, representing the green astral light. The question mark is a representation of this as well. The dot represents the black sun, but I'll get into that and more symbols in a separate video. We're just reviewing basics. This goes deep. Pin the tail on the donkey reveals these same concepts. We use an X attached to an arc. You get what I'm saying. The bullseye used in darts and archery is yet another symbol of this exit hole. The center of our flat plane, like the bullseye, is the desired spot that we must hit. 
Many airplane pilots over the years have come out about a huge hole where the North Pole should be. The North Pole is forbidden to fly over, and all pilots know this. So, hidden in plain sight is the name of the game. Our controllers have been telling us, and because we've been indoctrinated with a very faulty worldview, we keep missing the signs. I'll be explaining more about this topic in the future. It's the most important truth that we can know. Remember guys, shed your blood over your divine intent, start sun gazing and reconnecting with Earth's energy via grounding mats or barefoot walking, and always remember, we are divine beings at the core, and no amount of deception can change this. So until next time, love you all, peace. Hey, thanks for joining me, hope you're doing well. In 1885, William Warren, the first president of Boston University, published his work Paradise Found, The Cradle of the Human Race at the North Pole. In the book, he recites scientific explanations and ancient cosmology that all point to the same conclusion. Paradise is located at the North Pole. Warren points to the Garden of Eden at the North Pole, as well as Atlantis, Mount Meru, Avalon, and Hyperborea. Hyperborea, the ancient Greek paradise, Broken down means beyond the aurora borealis. This emerald-colored light shoots out of the center of our plane, where there is a vortex leading into this long-lost paradise. In his book, Warren mentions the night skies of Eden, showing an early depiction of the aurora borealis. And over the years, many have suggested that Hyperborea was the original Garden of Eden. So Hyperborea, Eden, Avalon, Agartha, Shambhala, these are all different names that have been given over the years to the same paradise. Warren calls the North Pole the navel of the Earth, and like I've been saying, all compasses point north to this paradise, urging us to come pass into Earth's center, Earth's navel. He discusses the tree of life and its relation to this paradise. According to Genesis, at the center of the Garden of Eden stood a majestic tree. Its fruit was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired. Similarly, many ancient cultures associated a tree of life, or world tree, with the center of the world, locating this tree at the true North Pole. The world tree is typically said to be a massive tree, extending high above the clouds with its roots deep in the underworld. We have Valagfa in Hungarian mythology, Yggdrasil in Norse mythology, the Ashvatha in Hindu mythology, the Kianmu in Chinese mythology, the Mayan world tree, and there's many more. Warren writes, where stood this tree was at once the source of all other trees and the giver of immortality. Through the center vortex is paradise. It's the holy grail in which when we drink from, we achieve everlasting life. Like Warren says, immortality. The world tree was real. Its roots extended up from the underbelly of our flat earth and this organism spread out across our plane. This was an interconnected organism made up of giant trees. Most of what we call mountains and plateaus are the stumps of these trees. They, along with the tree of life, were cut down. And this truth is revealed to us in James Cameron's Avatar. The main tree of souls is said to be the closest connection to Ewa. Ewa in Avatar is the guiding force and deity of Pandora. The natives believe that Ewa acts to keep the ecosystem of Pandora in perfect equilibrium, but the tree of souls which connects to this deity is cut down, just like our tree of life was. Ewa refers to our connection with Mother Earth, Gaia, the divine feminine goddess. This is clear because Ewa comes from the Celtic word Dewa, meaning goddess. Once the tree of life and the other interconnected trees were cut down, our connection to this goddess diminished and the spiritual and physical equilibrium of this plane drastically shifted. Both sides of Flat Earth used to be paradise, but by cutting down this tree and therefore our ties with the Divine Mother, along with many other events that occurred around the same time period, this side of our Flat Earth became a cradle for Archonic and Reptilian influence. This majestic organism isn't dead, however. It is still well and alive past the center vortex. Warren writes, Every indication points us to the Northern Pole. It was in Aaron Vej, the Persian Eden. He claims in Aaron Vej there was said to be a sacred mountain. This is Mount Meru. Like I said, mountains are giant tree stumps. So Mount Meru, the magnetic mountain which is depicted all throughout ancient cosmology, is actually what's left of the Tree of Life. In this map made by the 14th century explorer Gerhard Mercator, there is an iron mountain at the middle called Mount Rups Nigra at the North Pole, with four rivers extending outwards. The tides on Flat Earth are not caused by the moon, but by these four rivers that diverge from Mount Meru. 
they breathe in and out, causing the tides. Eden was also said to have four rivers. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became four heads. Mercator described the island in a 1577 letter to John Dee. In the midst of the four countries is a whirlpool, in which there empty these four indrawing seas which divide the north. Right under the pole there lies a bare rock in the midst of the sea. Its circumference is almost 33 French miles, and it is all of magnetic stone. In his 1904 Manual of Tides, Dr. Roland A. Harris gathered evidence from tidal patterns and sightings by Europeans and Inuit that all pointed to undiscovered lands near the pole. To Harris, the tides suggested that there was a hidden mechanism at the North Pole that influenced the tides. This mechanism is the Four Rivers. So Warren talks about the Persian Chinvat Bridge being situated near Mount Maru by Aaron Vesh, the Persian Eden. Warren writes, the Chinvat Bridge extends from the North Pole of the Heavens to the North Pole of the Earth. In a previous video of mine, I describe how the Norse tail of the Bifrost Bridge is linked to the center of our plane. Those who cross the Bifrost successfully are transferred into Asgard, the land of the gods. William Warren at the end of the book concludes long lost Eden is found, but its gates are bared against us. Now, as at the beginning of our exile, a sword turns every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Similarly, the story of the Bifrost Bridge speaks of Heimdallr. Heimdallr is the watchman of the gods, and he sits on the edge of heaven to guard the Bifrost Bridge, determining who crosses to and from Asgard. We know this is talking about the center of our plane because Heimdallr is often connected to Yggdrasil. In the same vein, one of the etymologies of the Chinvat makes it the Bridge of the Judge. This tells us there is a spiritual filter in place at the center vortex, meaning only those who vibrate at frequencies of love and truth can pass through. And after being in this matrix of control for so long, we must signify to the universe that our intent is divine, and therefore our passing into Eden won't have negative repercussions. To activate our intent and align it with the vibrations of truth, we're engaging in blood over intent. We're spilling our blood over the intent to bring forth heaven on earth, and this will be the spiritual marker that allows us to pass into the Garden of Eden, pass the flaming sword, so we may drink from the Holy Grail. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. The Saturn moon matrix, the various frequencies that hit us at every angle, along with a lifetime of indoctrination, has attempted to keep us in confusion. Blood over intent is our final announcement to the universe that we refuse to be kept in bondage or play into any false realities. It both raises our awareness and reprograms this hologram. The 2012 movie Upside Down is an allegory for our displacement out of Eden. The film starts with the main character, Adam, telling the story of his realm, where two worlds lay on top of one another. Two twin planets whirling together around one sun, but each with its own and opposite gravity. Now in our world, it's possible to fall up and to rise Adam and Eden are lovers. They are from the opposite worlds and therefore are not allowed to have intimate contact. Because of this, they are attacked one day, and Eden falls and hits her head. Adam grows up and finally is reconnected with Eden, only to find out she's forgotten all about him. The accident caused her to have amnesia. But over the course of the movie, Eden starts remembering Adam, and the paradise that was found in their love is rekindled. At the end, the love between Eden and Adam create everlasting ripples in reality. And because of this, both worlds become a paradise where the prejudice and separation are dissolved. At the beginning of the movie, we see an upside down triangle. An upside down triangle where the tip is pointing downwards symbolizes the female. When we bring the inverted triangle of the feminine together with the upright triangle of the masculine, we find balance. The upside down triangle is pointing towards the source of the goddess, the black sun. The union between the masculine and feminine, as I've discussed in other videos, will reactivate our divinity. In the same vein, our union with the Garden of Eden will do the same, giving us everlasting life. The inverted triangle shows our flat, motionless plane on top, and it's all converging downwards, much like the singularity of a supposed black hole. 
I've said in other videos, black holes aren't in space. Space does not exist. It's a fabrication, along with our globe model, to ultimately hide the fountain of youth at the center. The reason black holes show a jet coming out is because they're slyly revealing to us that the aurora borealis shoots out of the center, where it's like a black hole, a vortex sucking those who pass through in. Funny enough, at the beginning of 2016, Stephen Hawking came out claiming that black holes are a portal into another realm. Like the movie, we were once connected to Eden. Outside forces tampered with our connection to paradise, and now we must find our way back. This information is coming out throughout myself and others now because Eden is calling. We are being guided home. And therefore, it's no coincidence this movement is growing and growing. Blood over intent is reshaping this energy extraction matrix we are in. And it's the focal point me and my blood brethren are gathering under for this journey to the center. I recommend those who haven't yet to replicate the videos you see and publish your blood beside ours. The act of publishing our blood over our written divine intent is powerful white magic that connects all of us to each other, and it will bring forth a new age where we will get to the center. A corporation was set up in our name when we were born, hence why the name on our birth certificates has all capital letters. Corporations are dead. This is how the elite see us, as the walking dead. We are spilling our blood and reclaiming our divinity by proving to ourselves, the goddess of this plane, and to the Aether Realm that we are well and alive, that we refuse to give in to this fake reality we've been fed, and that ultimately, we intend to get to the Garden of Eden. We're taking back this matrix and this isn't going away. Our blood is creating ripples, I can feel it, and so can others who have spilled theirs. This journey is happening within a few years' time. There's no stopping it. Our compass needles will be our guide, and we will pass through where the Aurora Borealis is shooting out. Recent discoveries have uncovered dates, agendas, and goals that connect the Jesuits to a massive deception for the purpose of a multifaceted end-time delusion. The design of this deeply hidden plot has been to change the perception of the masses regarding the authority of the Bible, the correct shape of the earth, the layout of the universe, and the Creator's position in it. This change in perception has prepared minds for the overwhelming delusion to come upon the world under the first woe, the fifth trumpet, prophesied in Revelation chapter 9. This delusion will be a demonic attack under the pretext of an alien invasion. Reportedly, Vladimir Lenin observed, A lie told often enough becomes the truth. This quote is discovered within the belief of most. The Earth is a sphere. It spins through space while orbiting the Sun, hurtling thousands of kilometers an hour inside our Milky Way galaxy. So ingrained is this belief, if one speaks of the words flat Earth, listeners snicker. The mental reflect of a flat plane from which a person might fall into an infinite space creates this disrespect. A globe Earth, because unproven, is pseudoscience, yet believed worldwide and passed from generation to generation, and any who question it is mocked and ridiculed. For millennia, well-educated people believed the Earth was flat and placed at the center of the universe enclosed there with a protective covering. In the early 16th century, Nikolai Copernicus introduced a different model of the universe in which the Sun lay at the center and the Earth revolved around it. Copernicus 
heliocentric model is taught today, while the earlier geocentric model has been utterly rejected. Less than a hundred years later, Galileo was persecuted by the Catholic Church for promoting Copernicus theory and forced to recant his beliefs and spend the last years of his life under house arrest. Galileo's persecution for promoting heliocentrism is surprising, as the Catholic Church initially supported Copernicus theories. Consider the following facts. 1. While some sources claim Copernicus never took the vows of a priest, he was a cleric and never married. Furthermore, the fact that in 1537 King Sigismund of Poland put his name on the list of four candidates for the vacant episcopal seat of Ermland makes it probable that, at least in later life, he had entered the priesthood. When Pope Paul III sought Copernicus for advice on how to reform the calendar, Copernicus at first demurred to answer. Later, he wrote a series of letters to the Pope containing accurate observations that actually served 70 years later as a basis for the working out of the Gregorian calendar. 3. For a long time, Copernicus refused to publish his beliefs on a heliocentric universe. Finally, in 1531, he published a brief abstract stating his theory in seven axioms. From this, the concept spread rapidly. 4. Two years later, Albert Windmanstadt lectured on the Copernican model before Pope Clement VII an action for which he was richly rewarded. 5. In 1536, Cardinal Schoenberg, who was Archbishop of Capua, urged Copernicus to fully publish his theory or, at the least, have a copy made at the Cardinal's expense. 6. Between 1539 and 1541, Copernicus published and distributed a 66-page letter and a preliminary chapter. 7. Copernicus explained in a letter to Pope Paul III that he finally yielded to the insistent urging of Cardinal Schoenberg, Bishop Gies of Com, and other knowledgeable men, and agreed to publish his manuscript. Copernicus' theory of a heliocentric universe was well known at the upper strata of the Catholic Church in his lifetime. While he preferred his theories published after his death, he ultimately agreed to publish his manuscripts on the persistent appeals of high church officials. Catholics were not first to reject Copernicus' views, for they themselves admit Opposition was first raised against the Copernican system by Protestant theologians for biblical reasons. The Catholic Church advanced Copernicus' heliocentric model, constantly urging him to spread it abroad, together with other theories that opposed the sacred scriptures. The necessity to change public conception from an accurate belief in a flat, enclosed earth to a false belief grew slowly. With sapient baby steps, the whole world would become amenable to the final delusion of an alien invasion under the first woe. The Catholic hierarchy had the perfect opportunity to lay groundwork for a global deception to culminate in this earth's final generation. This deception required a globe Earth spinning throughout the vast reaches of space, space inhabited by aliens and other sentient life forms. These contrivances created doubt in the Bible, putting science ahead of Scripture, which advises mankind the Earth is enclosed and unmoving. They also place the Creator far away from His creation by presenting a universe 
unimaginably vast. To engineer this transformation in belief, the newly created Society of Jesus, commonly known as the Jesuits, became the agents of change. The Roman Catholic Church was waging war on the new Protestantism believers having come from their own system, while Copernicus was resisting appeals to publish his theory of a heliocentric solar system. Under the approval of Pope Paul III, the Jesuit order was established in 1540, and Copernicus dedicated his book, Revolutions of the Heavenly Bodies, to this very same Pope. This newly formed order, the perfect instrument to implement a clandestine operation for the Pope of Rome, began changing the public perception of the authority of the Scriptures, the Earth, and the Creator through the Copernican Revolution by deliberately teaching their followers to invite demonic spirits into their human spirits, the Jesuits exposed what manner of mankind each truly was. The Jesuit founder, Ignatius of Loyola, had taught all members of the Society of Jesus certain spiritual exercises which made them practical, mind-controlled slaves to Satan. They were to daily become as corpses or cadavers, that they unhesitatingly obey the will of their superiors. In opening the mind to the influence of demons, these Jesuits brought in a spirit of malevolence, a demonic intelligence that was unprecedented in Catholicism. Now, satanically controlled, the Jesuit priests became successful in every evil endeavor. They became infamous for their skill at deception and subterfuge, their ability to infiltrate governments and institutions of learning, their standing as advisors to kings and new leaders in education. The very influence they wielded was tantamount to becoming humanly insurmountable. Working through government entities and in the field of world education, they guide scientific research to further their own ends and present the biggest lie of all time, a globe Earth. Following Copernicus publications, it is probable the Jesuit order has produced more astronomers than any other demographic in Europe. That, ostensibly, a religious order should produce so many scientists should cause surprise. However, as these scientists have focused nearly exclusively in but one area, this gives us reason to question. Upon rejection of the sacred scriptures, which teach us Earth is a fixed, immovable object under a protective covering, a nefarious foundation was laid. Atop this were built perversions designed to force humanity to doubt the very word of our father Yahuwah. With the biblical geocentric model rejected, a new explanation was required. A globe Earth, its orbit of the sun for millions of miles every year, illimitable realms of space with billions of galaxies, each composed of billions of stars with worlds innumerable. All this became necessary to explain the new heliocentric model of the universe, and mankind, over a short time, lost his divine significance. Thereafter was created an environment within which the writings of Charles Darwin found a receptive audience. Once science showed the Bible wrong, the disparager then diverged from her religious guise altogether. Anything suddenly became possible. There was nothing above question, including how the Earth seemed to appear in the vastness of space with all else and the existence of extraterrestrials. The Big Bang Theory is, today, the leading explanation about how the universe began, 
At its simplest, it talks about the universe as we know it, starting with a small singularity, then inflating over the next 13.8 billion years to the cosmos that we know today. Priest Andrew Pinsent holds advanced degrees in theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, as well as a doctorate in particle physics from Oxford. In January 2015, he wrote, Being both a priest and a former particle physicist at CERN, I am often asked to give talks on faith and science. Quite often, young people ask me the following question. How can you be a priest and believe in the Big Bang? To which I am delighted to respond. We invented it. Or more precisely, priest Georges Lemaitre invented the theory that is today called the Big Bang, and everyone should know about him. The author of the Big Bang Theory was none other than the Jesuit-trained priest Georges Lemaitre. On October 28, 2014, Sarah Kerr reported, Speaking to members of the Pontifical Academy of Science, the Pope said it is possible to believe in both, insisting God was responsible for the Big Bang from which all life evolved. L'inizio del mondo non è opera del caos che deve a un altro la sua origine, ma deriva direttamente da un principio supremo che crea per amore. Il Big Bang che oggi si pone all'origine del mondo non contraddice l'intervento creatore divino, ma lo esige. L'evoluzione nella natura non contrasta con la nozione di creazione, perché l'evoluzione presuppone la creazione degli esseri che si evolvono. Follow from cause to effect. 1. Without a globe Earth circling the Sun through the far reaches of space, we do not have the Big Bang. 2. Without the Big Bang, we do not have evolution. 3. Without evolution, we are more likely to accept creation as an act of intelligent design by a divine creator. The Roman Catholic Church does, in fact, accept evolution. Acceptance of evolution and its integral law of survival of the fittest gave rise to the bloodbaths of the 20th century in which millions lost their lives. Numerous researchers have established incontrovertible connections between the Vatican and the Nazi Party. Regardless of the level of collaboration between the Vatican and the Nazis, what happened after World War II is even more significant. Operation Paperclip smuggled hundreds of Nazi scientists, including top SS officers on trial for war crimes, into the United States for use in America's Cold War space race. One of these Nazi Party members, Werner von Braun, was promoted to head up NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Under Operation Paperclip, some 350 German scientists and former intelligence agents were given visas and well-paying jobs. Many of these scientists had questionable pasts. Braun himself had been an active member of the Nazi Party, and his colleague at NASA, Dr. Hubertus Strogold, a specialist in aviation medicine, had performed experiments on concentration camp inmates. The purpose of this massive and illegal undertaking appears to have been for the establishment of a worldwide authority on all things relating to space and astronomy. NASA became the public face of space. It has long acted as a front providing an unsuspecting world with pseudoscience legitimized by the backing of the U.S. government. NASA is its own monopoly. It controls the dissemination of public information on astronomy while hiding facts it does not want the public to know. 
While many countries and universities have observatories, always it is the statements, photographs, and discoveries of NASA that make the news headlines. With NASA in charge of the flow of astronomical information to the public, it appears the Vatican has remained a central player in the truly accurate astronomy not being released to the public. For hundreds of years, the Vatican has owned more telescopes and observatories than any organization, private university, or government. NASA and the Vatican jointly own Lucifer, the world's largest binocular telescope. According to the official Vatican website, the Vatican Observatory is one of the oldest astronomical institutes in the world. And yet, where are the photographs? Where are the news releases of the latest discoveries? Precisely what have the Jesuit astronomers been doing for the last 500 years? Only they know. NASA's public release of information promoting the idea of an expanding, thus ever larger universe of incomprehensible size has led to the supposition there must be alien life on other planets. After all, if the Big Bang produced life on Earth, why couldn't intelligent life have evolved elsewhere? In combination with Hollywood and the science fiction genre, NASA has created an environment in which contact with extraterrestrial life forms is both fearful yet desirous. A recent book may hold the key to understanding the final steps in this long conspiracy to delude the final generation. Authors Tom Horn and Chris Putnam recently published a mind-boggling book in which they allege the Vatican actively seeks extraterrestrial life with their new Lucifer telescope. The book Exo Vaticana, Petrus Romanus, Project Lucifer and the Vatican's astonishing plan for the arrival of an alien savior asserts the Vatican is waiting for an extraterrestrial savior. In researching their book, Horn and Putnam were granted permission to visit the observatory on Mount Graham, which hosts the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope, VAT in September 2012. Not only were they able to discuss the study of deep space with the Jesuit astronomers there, but they also gained access to one of the top Vatican astronomers in Rome. Horn said brother Guy Consolmagno, who has also been called the papal astronomer, told the authors some astounding information during five interviews. He says without apology that very soon the nations of the world are going to look to the aliens for their salvation, said Horn. Consul Magno also gave the authors private Vatican documents which reveal much of the thinking of high-level theologians and astronomers within the church. Horn said these documents show that they believe that we are soon to be visited by an alien savior from another world. These statements are not that shocking when the Vatican's ever-evolving stance on science and space is understood. On May 12, 2014, Pope Francis expressed a willingness to baptize extraterrestrials who indicated a desire for baptism. While the comment was clearly tongue-in-cheek, it made international headlines, this one crowing, Cool Pope is so cool that he is willing to baptize Martians. The net effect? It removed the idea from science fiction and transferred it to the realm of possibility. Talking about it as if it were possible gives rise to minds more accustomed to the construct. After the Vatican hosted a five-day conference on extraterrestrial life, Catholic priest Jonathan Morris appeared on U.S. Fox News to answer some questions.
H how would it change the church's teaching then? Well, you, if you consider yeah. for a moment, if you determine that there is a extraterrestrial life there. Well, uh, one thing would be fascinating would be not only extraterrestrial life, but if it were extraterrestrial intelligent life forms. That would definitely make us go back and say, maybe our understanding of perennial truths needs to be updated. Now, the way we look at it is this. It's not about whether or not God was the creator, whether how, but rather how he created. It's not a question of whether original sin, this Adam and Eve story, is true or not, but our understanding of how that played out. So it's, in, it's growing in our understanding of perennial truth. Uh, I think that's an interesting explanation there. And I think also if it were determined, Father, that would be an earthquake, would it not? It would be. Teaching? It would be, and uh, especially um, if uh, the Vatican were <laughs> involved in accepting that. Questioning the cosmology of the earth often leads to people doubting scripture and its author and prepares the way for the overwhelming deception prophesied in Revelation chapter 9. Earlier it was stated, the Catholic hierarchy was presented with a perfect opportunity to lay the groundwork for a global deception to culminate in the final generation. The purpose for this intricate, multi-layered deception is to deceive the world's masses and create a desired outcome. To usher the world into a united one-world religion with the Pope reigning supreme, the devil will create a problem. This problem among Earth's citizenry will demand a solution. The solution will have a predetermined outcome. Our wise Creator has revealed this culmination of deception in Revelation 9. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven onto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts up on the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of Yah in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion, when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. The key to unlocking this prophecy is found in the phrase bottomless pit, from the Greek word abusos, also translated deep in Luke 8.31. Demons beg to be sent into the swine rather than back to the bottomless pit, the same as the English word abyss. The star fallen from heaven refers to Satan, and when he is given the key to the bottomless pit, he releases hordes of demons onto the earth, appearing as an alien invasion from space, the first woe. These evil angels, as extraterrestrials, will have a distinct appearance and will launch a horrific attack on the earth, lasting for 150 literal days. The trumpets are both a solemn warning and a merciful invitation. They warn probation will soon close and invite all on earth to accept Yahuwah's free gift of eternal life. Those who heed the trumpets' warnings show their loving gratitude by living in compliance to Yahushua's will 
and are in obedience to all the requirements of His divine law, including the fourth commandment. The trumpets are loving gifts to these living saints of Yahuwah, who, after the close of probation, stand in the sight of a holy Elohim without a mediator. Almost 2,000 years ago, well before a Roman Catholic or Jesuit ever appeared, this series of events was foretold. Does not the amazing foreknowledge of our Father truly strengthen our faith? The righteous will see the trumpets unfold as prophesied, and their courage is strengthened. They are led more steadily to rely on the promises of Him who cannot lie. We know the alien invasion is the manufactured problem. Naturally, a representative of mankind will be chosen to negotiate a peace treaty with these invaders. The solution will be predetermined and under the direct control of Satan himself. Francis, the eighth and final Pope, steps forward to negotiate this faux peace. A Jesuit, he has come under the direct control of demons by way of the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola. Francis has previously ensured he has sympathetic ties with all religions. Thus will be the logical choice as mankind's representative to establish a peace treaty with these invaders from outer space. This treaty will 1. End the war exactly 150 days after it starts. 2. Place the Pope at the head of the New World Order as mankind's representative. 3. Place the Pope as mankind's savior at the head of a new, unified, one world order and religion. As savior of the world, the Pope will then be in a perfect position to establish one common worship day for all, Sunday, calculated by the Papal Gregorian calendar. This unification under one government and one religion will appear logical to those more desirous to have a traitorous peace in a sinful world than to live as is their Creator's way, which brings in eternal life. These want only an easy way out and will join and enforce Satan's new one-world theocracy. All heads of state will hand their sovereignty over to the Pope as Scripture explicitly spells out. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet but receive power as kings one hour with a beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. This is the event that begins the final struggle between the forces of good and evil. Under threat of continued extraterrestrial aggression, the peoples of earth will come together to wage relentless war on all those who stand for Bible truth. The conscientious few who place the word of Yah above all earthly mandates will be seen as renegades. Individual religious liberty will be sacrificed for a promised yet finite safety. It is better for a few to perish, it will be argued, rather than the entire world is plunged into suffering under continued alien aggression. When the fifth seal was opened, John saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of Yahuwah and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? The answer given is portentous and foreshadows the intense persecution that shall come upon the righteous under the first woe. During that time, many will be martyred for their faith 
as they refuse to unite with the wicked world to worship on a day that pays homage to Satan, the great deceiver. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. For five hundred years this Jesuit conspiracy has taught the story of a globe earth circumnavigating the sun, itself spinning around the center of an immense galaxy which likewise speeds with over billions of galaxies throughout limitless space. Within this immense realm surely there are other varieties of intelligent life which inhabit other worlds? These lies climax with the alien invasion prophesied in Revelation 9. The ultimate act will occur when Francis, as Satan's representative, assumes leadership of the world while negotiating a peace treaty on behalf of the human race with the fallen angels. Then, Satan will have achieved his long-desired goal to rule the earth. The first wall reveals the opening sequence of events in Satan's endgame to deceive the world. For centuries, the Jesuits have worked to convince the human race the world is round. This Jesuit Pope unites mankind in infamy, all under one government and one religion, none of whom will ever know the beauty of eternal life. And this so very close to the second coming of Yahushua, the world's Messiah. Pope Francis then stands before those left upon the earth as their prime benefactor. The truth is, an extraterrestrial invasion is not possible within an enclosed earth. None would fall for this delusion with scripturally clear and a spiritually correct understanding of the layout of our earth and Yahuwah's universe. People who know the truth would quickly realize any extraterrestrials appearing in our closed system must then be demons. And any attempt to place the Pope at the head of a unified one world religion would notoriously fail. The Pope would never be accepted as the savior of the human race in a brokered peace treaty with demons. The masses would see Francis colluding with fallen angels and turn from him with abhorrence. So you may have heard of the secret oath of the Jesuits. I looked into that and I, what I found is this um, book called the Monita Sacrita. It's on openlibrary.org. And it was written by an ex-Jesuit, and um, it was published originally in the year 1723. And I didn't read the whole thing, but I just skipped through it, and so I just want to share a few things here. Um, if you want to look more closely into it, I'll leave the link below. So it says, The greatest possible care must be taken that these instructions do not fall into the hands of strangers. But if this should happen... Let it be denied that these are the principles of the society, and let such denial be confirmed by those of our members whom we are sure know nothing of them. So it's saying there are some people within the order itself who don't know the ultimate agenda, which makes sense because we know a lot of um, organizations do that, a lot of secret societies do that. Chapter 1, it says, In order to render itself acceptable to the inhabitants of a place, the object of the society will be of great service, it is necessary to discharge the most humble duties in hospitals to visit the poor and the afflicted and prisoners that the principal inhabitants may be led to admire and love our people. So I'm just going to skim through what I've highlighted in here. And then it says, and cause them to be more liberal towards us. Um, and then it says, all must learn the same outward manner. Be cautious in buying land. Let this be done in the names of some trusty and secret friends. Let the purchases which are adjacent to our colleges be assigned to colleges at a distance, by which means it will be impossible that princes or magistrates can ever have certain knowledge of the revenue of the society. So, I mean, they're trying to hide their revenue. And then it says, let the greatest amount be always extorted from widows. 
um, and let what is contained in the Roman treasury be kept secret. And this reminded me of Matthew 23, where it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayer. Um, and make long prayer for a pretense. I mean, that sounds to me like most of the church leaders that are in existence now. I mean, there's probably a few that are truly sincere, but most that I've seen, they all use the same vocal inflections while they're doing it. So, I mean, you can tell that they're, that they're, they are reciting these prayers just to conform to a community. And it actually says that right here in verse five of Matthew 23, but all their works they do is to be seen by men. Um, in other words, they're just doing it to be accepted by other people. It says they love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But Jesus says, do not be called Rabbi because all of you are brethren and um, do not call any human father. Your father is in heaven. Neither be called masters. He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And then, he, and then again, he says, woe unto you hypocrites for you devour widows houses and then isaiah 10 also talks about this it says woe to them that decree unrighteous decrees and that write grievousness which they have prescribed that widows may be their prey and then it says without me they shall bow under the prisoners and they shall fall under their slain because of course all throughout the biblical text it says okay their judgment is coming um and so this 18th century book right here supposedly translated from the Jesuit secrets themselves from an ex-Jesuit um, says that the greatest amount should always be extorted from widows and let what is contained in the Roman treasury be kept secret. Okay, well, everybody knows that the Roman treasury is filthy rich now. That's not a secret anymore. And we know the Jesuits vow their allegiance to the Pope above all. So their success at gathering wealth, which is what that book was talking about, is is pretty much evident at this point. It's not a secret anymore, although they originally said they were trying to keep it secret several hundred years ago. I mean, this is the crown of, of jewels. Apparently, it has sapphires, rubies, emeralds, and other gems covering it. Their robes, we know, are made of fine silk and linen, or fine linen and silk. And I'm not an expert on this, but I, in just a short search, I found at least three different thrones that the popes sit on, which I don't know why anybody needs to sit on a throne. I'm just, I'm 100% certain that Jesus would not be sitting on a throne while people are lying in the street homeless and starving to death. I mean, and, I, and a true representative of Jesus wouldn't do that either. And I think we pretty much all can see that, I mean, at this point. And so they... The agenda that the Jesuits had in this book, clearly they have been successful at that because their agenda was to acquire as much wealth as possible for the church and um, to do it at any means necessary. And so it's clear that they, they were successful at that, that they acquired their wealth and their status, very successful at that. Um, so, and this pretty much explains that they used really evil means of doing that. And then it says here in chapter two, every means must be employed at the beginning that we may gain the ears and minds of princes and leading men so that there may not be any who may dare to rise against us. Um, and then it says their evil deeds interpret them favorably under the pretext that is for the common good. Not only that, it says right here, if the prince begins to do anything that's not acceptable, he must be encouraged and urged on. And it says here, those who are of great authority in the state, they must be used in subduing and restraining the sort of people who are oppressed to our society. So they're going to use the government um, to get rid of their their enemies, or which are probably the good people in the world, the people that don't want to be part of it. Um, and then it says, let our people so direct princes and illustrious men that they may appear to aim only at the greater glory of God, for their aim must not be must not immediately, but gradually be directed to political and secular dominion. So very slowly over time, they're saying they want to take over the governments, basically. Um, and then here, this is another one. 
Um, that's especially bad. It says greater efforts must be made against those who attempt to set up schools for the education of youth. Let it be shown to princes and magistrates that these people will cause disturbance unless they are prevented. It's talking about people that just want to help children. They're to be demonized. Um, and then it says here um, concerning winning over rich widows to the society. It says that they down here. um they're going to do all these things that they may be more easily withdrawn from the conversation of visits and, and suitors. So they want these widows to, to remain lonely so they can take all their wealth and property. Um, and then it talks about in what manner widows are to be secured and their property disposed of. So this pretty much explains why Jesus kept talking about widows all the time, saying those who, you know, devour widows' houses. This is it right here. And then it says here... Um, let the mothers be instructed to annoy their children, even from infancy with reproofs, castigations, etc. And especially when daughters are grown up, let them be refused ornaments and a parable, apparel suitable to them. Then it talks about how they increase their revenue by accentuating those who are poor within their community, but keeping secret those who are wealthy. And I mean, that just shows you that they don't even take care of their own. They simply use their destitute to advance their own agenda. And then it says it's necessary to dismiss as an enemy whoever has alienated those who are devoted to the church or persuaded any rich person or any person well disposed to leave. And also it's necessary to dismiss those who show greater affection for their relatives when disposing of their property. So if someone wants to leave their house to their child, for example, then this society will not accept them and dismiss them as an enemy for simply wanting to give their own property to their children. Um, and personally, when I was looking at this, the first thing I thought of was that this is the binding of the tares right here, because obviously these the, they're, they're taking in people that are really evil and, and, and making enemies of those that are actually good people. And I mean, it, it just immediately reminded me of Matthew 13, which says, gather first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them in other words bind them in bundles in order to burn them i mean that's symbolic but we know these texts are telling us a nuclear event is coming that's the burning and some will a great multitude will be saved from that a multitude that can't be counted but before that the tares the bad seed will be bound together in bundles so i mean that's that's just what this seems like to me because um, if you continue reading this, you'll see they, they're di dismissing good people and keeping the bad. Um, so they dismiss those who care for their relatives right here. And then not only that, they actually harass those people. Um, it says, okay, those people that care about their relatives, well, we'll we're going to dismiss them. Um, but But that they may not afterwards complain of the cause of their dismissal, which was that they cared for their own family, then... Um, let them not be dismissed immediately. Instead, let them be harassed with chapters and public censures and let them be restrained from recreation and com conversation with strangers. Let them be deprived until they are driven to murmuring and then let them be dismissed as persons pernicious to others by bad example. Um... So, and then it goes on, it says they will also do this kind of thing to those who know their secrets. First, let them be persuaded to promise in writing that they will never write or speak anything injurious to the society, but at the same time, let the superiors preserve in writing their evil inclinations, failings, and vices, which they themselves have at some time given according to the custom of the society. So it's talking about their confessions right there. Um, their, their Catholic confessions will be used against them. Then it says, um, it says, this is what's done to those who simply know their secrets and are dismissed. I mean, they might not even tell anyone the secrets their whole life, but just because they know some of the secrets, this is what is done to them. It says they are discredited and harassed um, simply because somebody suspected that they might tell the secrets later, not because they actually did anything. And by, and, um, by the way, this is still happening in our own day and age. I've been talking about that. I just uploaded a video on it. Um, it's called organized stalking and harassment. So this is still going on. Um, so I'll try to remember to link that below that video if you're interested in that. Um, 
and then it says right here outright what they're doing is suppression so let me just let me just read through here it says it must be contrived that we may keep up an intimate correspondence with someone in the family in which the dismissed reside and as soon as anything is discovered blamable or deserving of censure let it be spread amongst the common people by means of persons of inferior degree who are attached to us so we're going to have somebody from the church spy on them hopefully somebody in their own family but it, you know if not they're probably going to use somebody else and if something bad is discovered we're going to we're going to tell everybody in the community and then it says but if they commit nothing worthy of censure and conduct themselves in a praiseworthy manner then let their virtues and actions which are deserving of commendation be depreciated by subtle insinuations and doubtful expressions until the esteem and confidence which is attached to them is diminished so basically if you can't find anything bad on them just make it up you know, just just imply that they're doing bad things. Um, and then it just outright admits that it's suppression, that that's what they're doing. Um, okay. And then it's, it talks about recruiting the men, let them, um, let them associate with us, taking care that familiarity does not produce contempt. Well, I mean, why would it produce contempt unless they knew that, some, that what they were doing was bad? And then this is, an, I'm just going to go through the headings of these chapters right here. You can read it later if you want to. And then it says, showing publicly a contempt for riches. So even though they're trying to gather wealth, they want everybody else to think, oh, they're not interested in that. And it says it will be necessary to act more. Res oh, here's a good one. Um, after they, they manipulate the wealth out of those widows, it says they're, it's necessary to be more resolute, to act more resolutely and sternly with widows and other persons who have given most of their property to the society. So basically manipulate them into giving all their wealth and then treat them badly after that. Um, and they talk about their methods of advancing the society. Um, and then this this at the end talks about the vows that their members take. I thought it was sort of strange how it says peculiar care in the education of boys. I'm not sure what that means. Then they promise special obedience to the Pope, um, blindly following whatever they're told to do by their superior who they believe holds the place of Christ. And in this one, this person is vowing to depose and kill all the kings and princes who don't believe in their ideology. So, um so that's pretty much it. We all know Pope Francis is the first Jesuit Pope. So um, we're just, there it is. That's, that's what the Jesuit agenda was hundreds of years ago. Um, at least part of it. And we've had ex-Jesuits come out recently and say that they were instructed to infiltrate Christian churches. So that's part of their agenda as well. 